Jay Reed, I'm a psychotherapist in San Francisco, California, and today I'd like to talk about boundaries, ambivalence, and guilt in recovery from narcissistic abuse. Okay, so those who've um, survived a, and I put this in heavy quotes, relationship uh, with a narcissistic parent or partner, no uh, definition of relationship that is actually an uncommon one. Um, you know, in a, in a traditional, what I think the term relationship means is that there's sort of a mutual coming together uh, that's marked by a, a reciprocity of wanting to understand uh, each other's perspective while also implicitly acknowledging and respecting uh, the separateness of the two individuals. Um, you know, what I mean by that is that neither individual can sort of know completely the other person. An attitude of curiosity is always necessary to honestly and I think legitimately understand uh, the other. And those are <clears throat> some very important markings of what is meant by relationship. But in, in a, a case of narcissistic abuse, what relationship can mean for the survivor of the narcissist is that um, that survivor must pay sole attention uh, to the narcissistic person, and that can be overtly. Uh, it can also mean just sort of um, privately in one's own minds and the sort of consciousness that um, in order to feel a sen any sense of connection to that to the narcissistic person, it can feel necessary to be attending to that person because that's very much um, kind of what the narcissistic person requires uh, to grant any sort of uh, tendril of, of connection. And if you have survived a narcissistic parent, uh, then the template for how relationships work may be influenced by this experience so that um, what is in fact uncommon in the world, thankfully so, uh, is felt to be the norm um, based on what one knows in the, uh, the family one grew up in. In these cases, the template you know may involve having to sacrifice attention to yourself from yourself. Uh, otherwise, it may feel like you have nobody and, and worse or, or relatedly uh, that you are nobody to no one. That was certainly the, the dilemma faced by the child uh, in relationship to a narcissistic parent. And the uh, parent in these cases holds the ultimate leverage. The child uh, fears being abandoned literally and in an emotional or psychological sense, neither of which are survivable for the young child. Uh, so the, the, the child ha has to contort him or herself into this narcissistic parents' conditions for being in contact with him or her. And so the bottom line for the survivor, as a child in this case we're talking about, is that they had to ignore, dismiss, and disconnect from their own perceptions, opinions, even physical sensations. Um, it's almost as if life is out there to be lived uh, for the survivor, but has to uh, kind of get on their tiptoes to see it uh, and to catch a glimpse of it. It's sort of, it can feel as though it's all over here and one has to strain uh, sort of constantly in order to sort of feel involved in it. This is such a different um, paradigm than what is striven for in recovery, um, where I, I think of that outcome as being um, getting to be the center of one's own experience, um, where the first sort of instinct is to turn to oneself and want to know what is going on within oneself. But um, there's a transition from that template where um, one is made to feel as though they are unimportant, um, not going to be included unless they really strain to kind of hope, hope that their presence will be noticed, to um, feeling like they are and they have all that they need. Uh, within themselves, and that relationships serve to complement that. Um, but that is not what is experienced um, in the course of, of um, a, a being in relationship with a narcissistic person, parent, or partner. 
Um, so to the point of that transition, uh, enter boundaries. You know, everything I'm describing um, reflects how in this narcissistic relationship, uh, everything gets tilted towards the narcissist. All the resources, all the uh, um, everything that sort of matters um, points towards him or her. And and con consequently away from the survivor uh, of this kind of relationship. And what a boundary can do, I think, um, is really to be an important step in evening that out. Um, uh, not necessarily with the narcissist, but for the survivor, him or herself, uh, to know that he or she can take action to limit contact that feels ultimately negative and unsatisfying to the person and um, promote contact with people that feels good. Um, that sense of agency is, d cannot exist in relationship with a narcissist. So um, just a, from a conceptual level, um, bound, a boundary, I think, is a very important um, juncture to get to, I think, in the process of recovery. Um, and a boundary can take all kinds of sizes and shapes and forms. Um, I don't want to, in this video, um, focus on any singular boundary, but to give examples, uh, you know, the, the, the boundary of going no contact uh, with a, the narcissistic parent especially is, is a common one. Um, limiting one's contact, uh, setting very specific terms for, that will work uh, for the survivor to have contact with the uh, narcissistic person parent or partner and um, being very clear that if that uh, the narcissistic person cannot adhere that the survivor will um, take the action to uh, remove themselves from the narcissistic parent not in a punitive way uh, but in a self-preserving way and it may not get reacted to as such uh, by the narcissistic person um, but that being able to over time be okay with that disagreement and provide safety for oneself um, should that disagreement result in a retaliation from the narcissist or, or whatever it may be, um, that it, it, it grows to be <clears throat> excuse me, very um, important and ultimately healing to know that um, one is no longer uh, coercible um, by the narcissistic person. And I want to emphasize that this is a, uh, everything I'm describing is always a process. Um, and so the outcome I just described is often worked towards. It, it, if, if there's lots of good reasons why that not, may not be possible at any juncture. And um, I really would encourage um, you know, anyone who's in this sort of boat to be very patient and, and empathic with oneself, with wherever uh, one is in applying and, and persisting a boundary for themselves. Um, sometimes it can just be too, frankly, dangerous to do that. And steps need to be taken to kind of um, increase one's sense of safety. And not just their sense, but their actual safety. Um, so just, I think that's an important caveat. So boundaries serve a really important function in breaking the template of, nar of a narcissistic relationship that can be established in childhood. And as I've discussed in prior videos, uh, the template for uh, how we learn what to expect from relationships, what is accepted, and how to win or feel a sense of security in relationships uh, is, is established in, in childhood. Um, and then often applied to subsequent experience. Well, if that template was forged with a narcissistic parent, um, this sort of imbalance is going to govern um, what one knows as like what relationships uh, uh, mean for the survivor. After this a sort of way to attach template is established, it's slow to change. And um, the person who holds it, um, uh, can feel very conflicted about operating in defiance of it. The thing with um, having a, <clears throat> a, an attachment template based on a narcissistic parent is that one's own needs rarely got met. Um, and so there's sort of this unfinished business, like one must keep um, instantiating that, that template because there sort of can feel like a sort of compulsive pressure 
to keep doing it to get what little crumbs were available to be gotten. Otherwise, everything sort of crumbles. And that pressure, um, when applied in subsequent relationships to kind of minister to the other and not and, and expect and, and often select people who give very little in return, um, it can feel very scary. Uh, scary is not even the right word. It can sort of, um, it, it takes time before uh, relinquishing that template uh, can occur. And it's a gradual process, an incremental one. And often it's very important to have alternative relational experience available. Um, you know, it can be in the form of therapy. It can be in the form of um, a good and healthy relationship. Whatever that may be, that's an important, often an important kind of go-between um, as someone works to defy this attachment template based on a narcissistic uh, the, a, a relationship with someone who is narcissistic. Um, and I want to point out three ways that um, people will often work to persist the attachment template they had with a narcissistic parent. And, and, I, and not often consciously, but the, these are things that have been um, talked about in theory and research of um, recovering from this type of uh, emotional abuse. And um, so there's a woman named Lorna Smith Benjamin who works um, a lot with attachment related trauma and she identifies three ways that people can um, persist uh, the traumatizing attachment template they learned in childhood and one is to act like that uh, abusive parent uh, the second is to act like that parent is still around and in charge and uh, the third is to treat oneself the same way uh, that the abusive parent treated uh, oneself and I think a boundary gets at that, those latter two. Uh, I think, you know, anecdotally, most folks watching this video and I think who um, are sort of, it, the recovery from narcissistic abuse is important. Uh, they, for whatever reason, don't do the first thing. They don't act um, like in the narcissistic ways that the parent was. And not just don't act, they sort of aren't built that way. Um, but what often can happen is that it feels, in order to just feel safe um, or to feel like one is complying with their sort of lot in the world that's really been imprinted from an early early age, uh, they can very much act like that parent around is, uh, excuse me, act like that parent is still around and in charge or uh, treat oneself the way the parent treated him or her. So setting a boundary uh, defies these latter two ways of staying, uh, of persisting that attachment template, which phrased a different way could be thought of as staying attached to this abusive parent. Um, and again, staying attached to that abusive parent, I think, is something to be hopeful, uh, to cultivate an attitude of empathy and understanding um, that, that detaching from that uh, abusive parent is a process and one to, a process to be respected. Um, that it isn't, it doesn't reflect any sort of broken wiring or anything in the survivor. That there are ways in which they may be acting uh, in ways that reflect a sort of uh, attachment to that abusive narcissistic parent. So this is a big change um, that can involve a mixture of both distress and hope, uh, setting a boundary. Uh, distress, I think, most importantly, can come from. The fact that as a child, the only way to occupy the shared reality with a narcissistic parent is to go along with that parent's implicit um, insistence that they are, in essence, more important than the child. Um, and to defy that as a child would have meant not being able to share a reality with uh, that parent. And being unable to do that, particularly as a kid, would have brought about intense dysphoria. In the prior video, I talked about dysphoria as this um, mix or melange of just really negative, ill at ease feelings, um, estrangement, and so forth. That may occur even as an adult, um, even as an adult in the process of recovery, um, and it can. It can be something that just has to be sort of worked through, talked about, um, tolerated to the degree possible within each uh, moment, 
day, uh, month, and then perhaps incrementally built upon. And, and over time, um, the dysphoria becomes less and less deterring to, to one's ability to set a boundary uh, with the narcissistic person. And importantly, there's likely to be hope that, you know, I could do this and I could survive, I could set the boundary and I could survive it and it's worth it. Even if that's held sort of hypothetically, um, that's an important um, part, I think, of the reasons to begin to consider setting a, setting a boundary and, and then um, implementing it. Another very common um, uh, experience when considering to set a boundary and then when doing it is the experience of ambivalence. Um, oftentimes in these relationships, the, the survivor is kind of groomed to take responsibility for the feelings of the narciss narcissistic partner or parent. And so if that survivor takes an action that um, prioritizes one, their own feelings above the parents, then it can be regarded as an act of betrayal uh, and disloyalty, and it, that it may, um, it can feel like for the survivor, like it um, could jeopardize the narcissistic person's emotional well being, as though that person's committing a very grave injury uh, to the narcissistic um, person by not taking over responsibility uh, for the narcissist. There can, you know, be, uh, one, if one does that and it feels like that's something that could break the narcissist, then a, a torrent of self-blame and intense guilt can, can come in. Um, it, there can be a, a, a realistic, often, fear of a terrible retaliation by the narcissistic parent because setting a boundary um, very much defies that, that uh, narcissistic person's sense of entitlement to being reflected and treated as the most important uh, person. Um, so these are things that often come up in the process of setting boundaries and, and, um, and adhering to them. And I think it can be important to just be aware of them so that, um, you know, if they do occur, these, that they one can offer understanding to oneself and um, maybe over time be able to comfort oneself in the face of these kinds of experiences. And I think a lot of survivors who, who take this step will have a, these kinds of questions pop up. Am I being too sensitive? Do I have it right? Is there something um, wrong in how I've been seeing things? Is he or she really narcissistic? Is there really something wrong with me? Uh, do I have an anger problem? Am I someone who holds on to grudges for too long? And I think in these cases, um, the best compass to trust is, in essence, how one feels inside. Um, and that's kind of easy to say. Uh, and, and, and I think it, it can take time and I think supportive other good relationships to suss out how one really does feel. But those, the, the hope I mentioned earlier or that sense of relief that might be offered with enough sort of safe distance from the narcissistic person, those I think are very trust, trustworthy indicators. Well, um, thank you for, for watching today. Uh, I will continue to address the, the, this issue of boundaries. I think it really gets at the heart um, of recovery from narcissistic abuse. And um, I hope everyone continues to be uh, safe and, again, appreciate your um, very, very thoughtful and um, often touching comments uh, uh, below the videos. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the community that seems to kind of be organically emerging is just um, really great to witness in, in how people support and relate to uh, each other. And just to, um, I really appreciate uh, folks taking the time to convey um, that they have found these videos useful um, and that it has been somewhat helpful in explaining some of, some of their experience um, in in their own lives. Um, so, so again, thank you. Um, stay safe, and I look forward to posting again next week, uh, Sunday at 9 a.m. Pacific time.